How's it going, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the James Loud Podcast. And today, my special guest is Brandon from In-House Genetics. How are you doing today, Brandon? Doing pretty good. How about yourself? I'm fantastic, man. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for making the trip down to the Bay. Well, I appreciate the time. One of the things, I, one reason why I came down here so I could sit across from you so we could we could have a conversation because the, the Zooms kind of, you kind of lose a little bit. I agree 100%. I, I like these in-person conversations better. I feel like you get to know somebody you get to look in their eyes like, and, and really see who they are. You know, I wish they, we were talking about longer style formats. I wish we had some more longer style formats, but these have been really interesting. The studio, my transition from the Future Cannabis Project, where it was all Zoom to the in-person, I really like these better. Well, I, I mean, it's impressive too. I mean, you put a lot of work into it, taking it very serious. You got mad respect for that. And I appreciate you actually doing it because the the space needs it right it's a yeah. great way to get the comp, you know the content and information out to people that actually really need it that are also learning cuz you know growing you're always always learning yeah and we're in this big transitional phase in the industry where it's great to be able to talk to some of the people that have a lot of history with the with the plant with the uh, the black market transitioning into recreational you know like yourself you you know you've been around a long time and uh Let's actually dive into in-house genetics and kind of let's let's take a step back from that and talk about where you got started in the industry. Yeah. So when you talk black market, I ref- like to refer to it as the gray market because it never <laughs> should have been illegal in the first place. I, I 100% agree. Um, but yeah, it's it's like any other typical story. Yep. Initial introduction, right? High school smoking right. to then selling, getting packs. We come from the Pacific Northwest. So Beasters was a thing, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, then you had this local, right? And mm-hmm. that's where... Uh, where you initially kind of get a start. And then then uh, what I noticed was is you had Canadian and then you had local. And yeah. the person at local was just super fire. And I was like, man, you know, I would love to start growing. You know, so you start searching. Nobody really talked to each other back then, you know, so yeah. you had to kind of go search for a plant. And so this is probably around this time, about 2002, 2003. Right. You know, so like any typical situation, you start off in a closet, you know. <laughs> it was way different back then, yeah. Yeah. But, um, but as you grow and you sort of start kind of creating like a co-op, like meeting people. It's like mm-hmm. kind of a secret club, right? And right. so you're coming up like that. And then you started getting pretty good at it. And came, uh, so in-house is two people, came across, met my partner, and uh, he was uh, really into genetics. And he started really uh, diving deep into it. But one mm-hmm. thing that I had is I had these grows around the city, yeah. you know, and uh, I was just more on the production side of stuff. And I, I started noticing – when he was, uh, when he first, you know, we started making seeds and then yeah. he just started getting, you know, good at it. So that's when I started paying attention. Yeah. And then, uh, we were talking one day and he's like, let me, let me build a room out in one of your places. Yeah. And I was like, well, what about the pollen? You know, like, you know, you're going to, you know, what happens if you seed on my whole place? And he's like, no, 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 it's all good. And so from there, we just started building out, you know, 10 by 10 areas, you know, eight by five area rooms, right. Digging them out and, and doing it, doing it properly. And so that was, that was about the time that uh, really came full on in, in, in the in-house genetics. Cause he was about a couple years, you know, into it, getting, getting pretty established. Mm-hmm. And then it was just like a match made in heaven because I had all these, all these, you know, genetics that we were sourcing. So you had access to the, the cultivars. Yeah, well, combination between the two of us. Right. Right. Uh, Marrying the libraries together and then breeding stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because um, especially about the time, because when you're thinking about it is is we always base ourselves off of quality, right? Yeah. So that the highest quality flowers and also going after, so like when you start growing OG strains, extremely hard to grow. Uh-huh. You know, and like when you're back in the day with the Bubba's, you're going to get a big old huge buds, right? And, you know, everybody loves that. But when you got into the OGs, they were small, hard, dense buds. You mm-hmm. know, the, the turkey bag didn't look that big, right? Didn't have the peeling. But once you start breaking it up, once you start, once you start tasting it, all that, it changes, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that's where you come is, is you pride yourself on the on the quality. So you're trying to find what's the next thing or what's going to be the next thing. So either you're popping seeds and hunting them, right? Mm-hmm. Or you're sourcing, sourcing the cut. So at any given time, we've always had anywhere from... 30 to a hundred different strains in some sort of rotation right. and all that, you know? And so as this is all going on, uh, in-house is growing, right? And uh, we're uh, we're uh, hunting through a ton of the beans at any given time. We're sourcing stuff. It gets it starts getting really super, super busy. Yeah. But we're just ultimately having a good time. But one thing that was really cool about it was we're putting in all this work, but 
this uh, this this following is amassing this in-house army we start right. seeing these tags we see like the, the posts and this is about the transitional time of social media coming on board becoming right. a big thing but it was cool because it was like a natural flowing uh build up relationship that we have and when it comes to when it comes to the work ethic right we work hard we're always working yeah. and so when you think about it as like like in-house in itself is kind of like an iceberg right everybody gets to see the tips of it but they don't really they don't get let, to see all the stuff that goes on 100% all the time like so whether it's through text message email uh whiteboard whatever it is we're constantly working on something and the communication is critical uh mm -hmm. between us and so what we do is is I'll be working on something. He's working on something. Well, uh, any given time, we'll know if something's coming on. But one thing that uh, we really, that's huge to us is we listen to what people are saying. And what yeah. I mean by that is, is if you're talking about something that you used to have or you didn't have anymore, and you know, you know, cannabis will go in cycles, right? So mm -hmm. you're trying to figure out what's the next thing, right? And yeah. all that. And the reason why we've been so successful in that is because we listen to what people are saying, yeah. right? So if people weren't talking or, or you know, being active, right, we would, we would, we would be missing. There'd be a big, huge component, and that's one thing that's that is really we pride ourselves on is is the people that support us yeah. and the people that uh, we get to interact with, and we're always watching, we're always listening. And as an example, when it comes to testers and everything else, right, mm -hmm. those are people that we watch for months, some cases years. And yeah. we're like, hey, you wanna uh, you wanna work with us? And and they're like, yeah. And the cool part is, is if you go back in the history of the testers, they're yeah. now high flying on their own, right? You know, right. So so we've been we're part of a lot of people's stories, not just from the testers, but the seed bank. So there's this this huge mesh. And, and, and you guys were exciting. breeding terps in. You guys were breeding good terps into your genetics. I feel like yes. part of your breeding program was always to offer good terps. You know. So, and, that comes back to the quality, right? Yeah. So like, um, so, you, you know, we have notebooks on notebooks on notebooks, uh -huh. right? When it comes to hunting and selections, right? right? And then uh, uh, plant health, yeah. right? You know, you have to have the most optimum healthy plant if you're going to do any sort of uh, breeding, any sort of pollination, because it's going to affect it as a whole. So now right. you're taking all this information, putting it together, and you're like, okay, this, this, this may be good. But also when you look at it, the hits, right, mm -hmm. is one number, but all the misses, right, oh, yeah. quadruple that or or mm -hmm. way more. There's a lot of stuff that never even hit the, you know, hit the cutting room floor, you know? Yeah, it's a statistical. It's a statistical game to a degree, you know, breeding. But pheno hunting and going through the selection process is so, you know, it's so challenging and it's so crucial that you're able to grow really well. And I think that's where some companies have hit it and some companies have missed. You have to be, if you're doing selections, you got to be able to grow good so you can tell the difference between this, this, and this, and maybe that's a hundred times over. Yeah, but like, but let's go back to what I was saying in cycles, right? Yeah. So depending on what's going on around the country, or what's going around. Right. So like, like you have, you have what you have is you have like California that's basically Mecca mm -hmm. to the cannabis world, right? right? Um, and then you have the sneaker, which is out of Vancouver, which actually yeah. took a lot of Amsterdam cups over the years, which yeah. gets glossed over a bit. So you have... This prideful folks up in the Northwest where we're from, and yeah. so you're you're you don't really want to do what everybody else is doing, yeah. right? But so so when you're going after something, you're looking for uniqueness and constant uniqueness, and that's mm -hmm. where the the terpenes profile starts coming in. You start learning and understanding right. what a terpene is, right? Uh, we just thought there was a handful of them at first. Now there's you know we're coming to find out there's three four hundred of them, you and know, thiols and all these other things. Yes. You know, I think there's forty thousand different different unique terpenes flavor yeah. molecules. Yeah, well, that's so, a so when you start doing your stem rubs, when you're you're checking the bud structure, this is kind of pre before we could get some testing, mm -hmm. right? But also, too, testing is a flawed in a bit because everybody's so set on high THC, right? right. You know, which when you go through high THC, you got to understand that there's, there's going to be some stuff that's missing. There's going to be mm -hmm. the CBD that's going to be gone, right? There, there's a toll that it takes for a high THC. Agreed. So back in the day when we were in the low 20s range, you know, mm -hmm. we still had a beef of a CBD. That's where, like, when people get nostalgic, that's the weed that they talk about, right. you know, right? So now you're taking, like I said, you're constantly taking this information and then you have this whole library of plants. And, and also, too, if you can't find something or you don't have it, you have a whole world out there of home growers mm -hmm. that you can hit up. Hey, can you give me a profile on that? Da, da, da. What would it take for me to, to get a cut of that? I'm going to grow that out because I'm going to you know put it into rotation. And that's one thing that we do a lot is, is we go back to the people that support us 
And we hit them up like, hey, what, you know, can we get a cut of that? And a lot of times people would be like, oh, I'll give it to you for free. But like, no, we got to give you something in exchange or, oh, or whatnot. Nice. But that just goes back to <clears throat> always constantly hunting for, for the best, you know, and staying right. on, on top of that, you know. And we've gotten really great hits by taking, you know, two great strains, right, you know, yeah. and crossing them together. Yeah. You know, uh, like we have a juggernaut that's out there, which is Slurking, you mm-hmm. know. Slurking is always will be special to us you yeah. know and there's a couple of reasons as an example slurking uh so it's it's, it's coming we we're harvesting for the hunt trying mm-hmm. it didn't really think anything too much about it yeah uh so the, you know my partner comes in the building and and uh he's like you got to check this out you know and we were trimming uh actually a local uh strain true og right yeah. we just took down and we, were, we had all the trimmers there so we had about 15 trimmers there and it's like there's all this commotion and the slur cane, it's just like at that time, you just didn't see that trichome build like that. Mm-hmm. And we just all kind of sat there kind of like in amazement and was like, damn. And uh, my partner goes, man, I tried to post this yesterday on Instagram. He goes, first 30 seconds on it, you know what they said? And I go, what's that? He goes, look at all that PM. <laughs> <You> know, <right? laughs> and uh, so he was like, man, I was up all night taking pictures, different angles and all that. So when you see the, like the Slur King initial old photos, right? Mm-hmm. That was that was my partner staying up all night trying to get the best picture of it. Because Completely as as it frosted out. out though. Yeah, that, yeah, that was, is yes. time. Like, you know, I mean, there's a lot of photos on Instagram, but I remember when you guys first started posting or I saw that on social media and how frosted out it was. It was it was it, amazing. And yeah. so so the, the guy that kind of, because, you know, at the time we had, a, we had a, you know, the trim team and there was a guy that was heading it. He'd yeah. come over and took, he's a, he took a double look. He's like, oh, man. It almost looked right. fake. You it, know? it truly did. Like, uh, it looked like, you know, how like, um, you know, you see people that will, you know, roll some key. For, they'll, they'll do something in order to boost the test, right? Uh-huh. And that's what that was all it was. It, but that was basically just the fresh first, you know, cut of slur cane. It's those moments that really define and stick out, right? Because yeah. we're like, this is huge. Now, the next step is let's put this out to the world mm-hmm. and see if they if they think it's huge, right. you know, right? Because that's where a lot of the stuff is, and especially the genius of my partner going, oh, well, let's not just give out any freebies, yeah, right? You know, we have, we have, we're working on a ton of stuff. We know it's fire. Some of the stuff is just not the right time for it. Yeah. Let's put those out as freebies. Let's put those out to the world. So when they get a pack, because what you'll see is, is, some will release months or even a year or even two years down the line and they see it, they go, Oh, I got that in a freebie, you know? So yeah. like one of the coolest things that stick out to me on the freebie aspect is I stopped by a farm down in Oregon and, and we've become great friends since then as it goes by rogue farmer. Mm-hmm. Right. And he bought probably 30 packs. Right. Mm-hmm. But he also had 30 just cross of in-house crosses. And he goes, I just popped everything and I'm running everything. Wow. And, uh, and that uh, was said, uh, and he's like, because everything that we've gotten from in-house so far is, is, is great and it flies. And so that's about the time when, you know, legalization was just coming on, you know, and I think it was like first like couple of years. Mm-hmm. That's when we had to kind of look and see what that, what that looked like and how that was going to shape and how we were going to fold into that story. But it's, but, but originally, but with the slur cane though, there's the uh, slur cane and the platinum kush breath. There's a few things where. We just know that will always, always stick out. And the people came back, loved it, right? Yeah. They said, you know, that's where people, because um, when you start hearing people's feedback in a way where they go, hey, uh, we bought it, I bought my in-house pack and and I was, I was, I was doing good with these other strains. But once that, once that in-house got into my garden, he's like, people started calling me, you know, yeah. uh, one guy, one guy sat in line at a high times event, which they were notorious for long lines. So I'm just oh, yeah. getting in there, right? The guy sat in line for five hours and he was like, man, I just had to come come meet you guys and see what's up. You know, mm-hmm. he's like, he's like, before I was just average. He's like, now my whole, my whole garden is in-house. He's like, I got, I got the dispensaries calling me. This was, I think up in Michigan or something like that. And I was yeah. like, man, that's, that's what it's about. I said, why didn't you just call me? I would have just came out, you know, right. <laughs> right? you know, you totally. don't have to stand in line in the heat for for five, six hours. But, but that's really where everything comes from is, is, it's the people that 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 you get to see have success from it, and then also too, there's there's a there's a great relationship there because mm-hmm. what they put out to the world, we try to to return to them, right? right. You know, and sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes it's like it's a it 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 gets kind of strange, right? Because 
in the small world, we're a really big, huge deal, right? But in the normal world, right? Yeah. Nobody knows. So you have to meet that person halfway. So that's where yeah. I think it's a it's a great relationship between any breeder and the people that buy their packs because there's a two way street there. You know, mm -hmm. I'll meet you halfway. Let's make this happen. And send us your send us your photo. We'll put it up. Social media has made that a little bit difficult the past couple of years because right. they you know they want to take you down for sure. But yeah, yeah. Social media has changed a lot in the last ten years. You know, and it's like I think social media can fool people too, where you got some stuff that looks amazing, but then in reality they're like they go to buy it, they get pop some seeds, and they get some stuff that has cardboard turbs. You know, and it's really evolved. And that's there's a blessing and a curse associated with social media. And I, I love the fact that we've been able to get out there and it's united a lot of people that we wouldn't normally be united with from all around the world too. Well, it's a, social media is a double-edged sword. Yeah. Because without social media, we wouldn't be sitting here. Right. Plain Absolutely. Simple, right. So the plant brings everybody together because without yeah. this plant, I wouldn't know you. You yeah. wouldn't know me. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if it wasn't for it also too, it wasn't for social media, if we could just stay doing our work and what we're, you know, we would have never, we would have never came out publicly or been as, as vocal as we are, but also right. too, we started seeing rumblings, right. Mm -hmm. Of the changes. And, and you know how things go when money's involved in this country. Right. right. You know, so when you start seeing, okay, you know, the reason why we're so vocal and support of home growers, right. Yeah. Is because we feel at the end of the day that that's who made us. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why I get to sit here and have this conversation with right. you, right? You know, so our our loyalty will always ride with them no matter what. A hundred percent. You know, and uh, and people are understanding that and that message is being conveyed. So, you know, we've been part of some, you know, action groups and, and, and advocating and, and stuff like that. But uh, without social media, you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to do that. Right. Yeah, it's it's interesting in how it's evolved and you know, YouTube, you know, we're, we've started to catch our stride on YouTube with the show. And but you know, and then it, we started on the Future Cannabis project and then that kind of evolved into this and now we're starting to catch our stride in with this and uh, you know, it's been a lot of fun. And also, yeah, it brings people together. Well, so you get a little bit of everything. Speaking of YouTube, right? Yeah. YouTube's great because there's an algorithm that brought me across the James Loud podcast, right? So I, I knew of you, right? Yeah. I, you, you're a well-known person, but I was like, I'm going to check this podcast out. And I think it was like episode number 10 or 12 or something like that. Yeah. And I just let it keep playing autoplay, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is great content, right? Yeah. And that's where I think a lot of stuff needs to get shifted to is, is putting out those type of content, getting these stories out, getting people, because because like I said, is is you can find tidbits of information that mm -hmm. might help somebody. And if you only help one person, then yeah. the whole thing is worth it. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. I mean, same thing with my book. It's like, if I change one person's life and make their life better or educate them in a way that's positive. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's all about putting positive things out there. Like you can do one or the other. It can just, you know, I, there's not a lot of stuff that's just neutral. Either you're a positive influence or you're not. Well, also too, you have people that just want to see the world burn. Right. right. Then there's actual people that are out there that want that want to truly learn. And that's the void that you're filling. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, out of the podcast that you cut, I've, I've listened to damn near all of them. I mean, wow. I spend we're always uh, working. Right. So mm -hmm. you, you got headphones in and you either it's between music or podcast. And there's some good stuff out there. And it's like uh, there are people that want to learn. And there are I want to tell these stories of these amazing people because there's so many amazing people in the world that have great stories. And it's it's. For me to be able to capture them, it's, you know, I feel really great being part of it. Going in the future, that's where that's critical. And I think that's where you're going to highly excel into that is bringing these stories out of out. You know, like we were mm -hmm. joking before the show. I was like, man, it'd be funny because you could do a VH1 behind the scenes, right? Absolutely. But also, also bring these folks because because there's a lot of cool stories, right? Yeah. There's a lot of like, um, like it wasn't too long ago that I used to wake up anxiety just ridden because... I was like, is today the day I get cracked? Yeah. You know, right? Because it's not you're scared. You're not, you know, when you're scared, you're nervous, all that stuff. Because because at the time, if you got cracked, I knew I was making the news. You know what yeah. I mean, right? Like, Absolutely. Like multiple places, all this stuff, and and uh, and that's a lot of stress to be to be having, mm -hmm. right? You know, then the medical starts coming in, and they get a little bit of relief of pressure, and. So um, you don't really 
grow up or you're, you're, you stop thinking that way. But, yeah. you know, like anybody that's ever done the gray market, as you would say, black market yeah. has had those fears. You know, the thing is, is, is we signed up for it because we knew what we were doing. Right. Yeah. And, and also too, if you got cracked, you know, keep your mouth shut. Right. Absolutely. You know, you knew the job was dangerous when you signed up. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that, you know, over the, like the same people that I worked with, uh, you know, back in the early 2000s, are still in it in some sort of capacity. Yeah. I'm still good friends to this to, to today, right? right? You know, like uh, I got a good friend. He's going back and forth from Thailand, yeah. doing some stuff, and actually being getting a lot of in-house love over there. He goes by uh, his name's Tony. He's Seattle's best on on Instagram, right? Nice. But we've been friends for over 20 years. Yeah. You know, so these bonds and these relationships and all this stuff that you build, but also too. We come from a time when 99 plants was a federal case, you know, and it was Absolutely. a big deal, right? And so I think where a lot of people that came up in the medical side of stuff, right, especially in California, all that, they don't they don't really necessarily felt that fear, right, or or have that same sentiment. So they're really blasé about a lot of stuff, you know, right. especially important stuff. So that's why I, I say is, is as quick as this started, it could end mm -hmm. overnight off right. of one ruling, mm -hmm. you know, and... And so when you when you take that into account where some people be like, no, that'll never happen, you know, but like I said, everything's profit driven. So now, you know, we're getting a, you know, we're getting all this information that's coming out. Like one of the biggest lies that they tell you is, oh, we can't research or we're not researching this or we need to research this. Right. Yep. But if you go to the NIH website, mm -hmm. you can see since 2015, they've spent almost two billion dollars researching cannabis. Right. More than half of that money went to the negative effects of cannabis. Yeah. Right. And what did they come out with? They came out with the inconclusive evidence, right? And they just throw this random stuff out there, right? Mm -hmm. Which which in many cases, you can make an argument that other medications, right, are the cause of, of what they're claiming that cannabis The contributing does. factors, for sure. Because it's really important to people to know what CB1 and CB2 receptors are, mm -hmm. right? They're in your body. They're like slots. So if you have a medication going into it, those slots fill up, right? Yeah. And then you put cannabis on top of that, your body's going to try to expel it. Yeah. Right. So you're going to have these adverse effects. You're going to have these issues. It's just like if you, if you, uh, you know, o you know, over, over consume, yeah. right. You know, those receptors are full and your body needs to expel it. So you're going to have these crazy effects, right. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a lot that goes into, I'm not a doctor. It's stuff that I've learned over the years from talking to doctors and talking to right. PhDs, you know, right. There's a, you know, there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to it. And we're just simply scratching the surface, surface of it as a day. Yeah, we're in an infancy. The industry is, I mean, I think a lot of people think we've come a long ways, but we still have a long ways to go. And we're just starting to understand the plant, you know, from a medical mm -hmm. perspective. And it's, it's a beautiful time to be in the industry too. So It's a great time. to. Well, no, look, it was never, even when it was illegal and you were dodging cops, yep. it was still a great time to be in there. Yeah. You know, like when you, if you want to get nostalgic about it, it was a stressful, terrible time. But at the same time, if you were talking to another grower, yeah. right, and you got past the, the you know, like, you know, the the vague conversations you would have, yeah. you know, right? Like, what kind of tomatoes yeah. you growing, right? Then you start getting down and you start sharing ideas. You start sharing tips. There's there's a lot <laughs> that that comes with that, you know? Right. And I don't mean to discount the people that are struggling right now, because I think there are a lot of people in the industry that are struggling and they're trying to figure out their next move and how to make it. And I think the price has gone down all over for flour. It's a very competitive market. And the one thing I can say is grow a better product. That That's the biggest thing is, is like to be competitive, you have to create something that's better than what else is out there. I mean, before you, people used to get by growing middle grade product and that's that's gone that whole middle grade thing is gone i think that people that live in that one percent if you're talking about quality they're going to survive and they'll be able to pivot and and hopefully be successful i think it's a beautiful i, I would say that there's there's room for all of it and what yeah. i mean by that is this is you have a situation where you have you always have your top high quality, mm -hmm. right? You're always going to have your have your folks for that. They're going right. to recognize that. They're going to go, hey, this is because because cannabis is a social situation, right? Right, and also too, it's a competitive situation. Mm -hmm. I found the better I found the better flower, uh, the better rosin, whatever it is. You're always yeah. going to have that demographic. Then you have the people that just kind of want something to turn the world off for a minute. Yeah, which which mids will fill that up. But mm -hmm. what what I think the real problem is, and, and a lot of people, especially if you're in the commercial world, yeah, go into any dispensary, any retail, mm -hmm. look on the wall, right? Take note of every strand that's on the wall. Yeah, then go back to your grow, and don't grow that, right? Yeah. Because you're gonna compete against 
in some markets, a hundred other people's version of fill in yeah. the blank. And you people know? that can produce it for cheaper. Unless yeah. you grow better quality, it's it's hard to compete with somebody who has a lower price point. So based off of the stuff that we've done in the past, and especially in the commercial realm, yeah. 2017, 2018, friend of mine comes, or he's a friend of mine now, but at the time we just, I think he just hit me out on a Facebook page or on Instagram or something like that. And he was like, oh, I run this 502 in Washington and yeah. I'm looking for new genetics, right? And I was like, well, come on by our spot, you know, and we'll see what's up, mm -hmm. you know? So I get to talking to him. His name's Roy. He's like, uh, he's like, I'm looking, I'm growing this, growing that. And I said, so is everybody else, yeah. right? And uh, I think at the time we had to, and the, the way the black cherry punch was coming up, um, there was a few, there was a few that were just, just coming into stride mm -hmm. on social media, like, you know, the tags and all that. Yeah. And uh, after you got off the initial little sticker shock for the clones, right? You know, I said, man, this, this might change, this might change what you're, you know, might change your way of doing things, right? Mm -hmm. Went back, grew them, and you can go back in the day, they used to track uh, 502 data, and you could go back to that date that he would, that he got those plants. And you can see three months later that his numbers went up. Now, there's a combination of two things, genetics and his hard work, right? right? So, you, you, you know. Uh, genetics is the foundational part. And then the hard work. And yeah. his hard work. And so, uh, same with, uh, I mentioned him earlier, Rogue Farmer, yeah. right? Runs heavy in-house every year mm -hmm. and does great. You know, uh, one of the, he's probably one of the hardest working farmers that I've met along the way. And I've met a lot. But uh, hands down, when it comes to outdoor light depth, you know, yeah. which everybody throws shade on, one of the best out there, you know. People throw shade on it, but it, it's a great, if you do it right, light depth is an amazing product, uh, you know. And then the mixed light with supplemental lighting is you can create a product that, you know, people are going to hate that I say superior to indoor. But I feel like the natural sun with light, you know, and now they have these inner canopy lighting mm -hmm. that, that you can use to tighten up those buds, I think. That's the future in a lot of ways, and I think it's a it's a more environmentally friendly product, uh, but it also is a different product. Well, it's it's also too like when you the mad dash when everybody got into the industry. One thing that stood out to me was like, why are we building indoors? Only yeah. reason why we grew indoors is because yeah. we needed to keep it away from the people that have alphabets on their chest. You know yeah. what I mean? The alphabet mm -hmm. letters, right? That, that, that's re you know why we needed to do that. But when you look at the Dutch and all this other agricultural folks that just kill it in every other crop, yeah. right? Cannabis isn't much different, right? Yeah. So you can create pristine environment in a in a glass, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse. Yeah, you know? these Venlos, these Dutch Venlos are amazing. I've been in some greenhouses where they got the flood and drain right there in the right there in the right there in the floor. You oh, know, yeah. this big old huge orb comes out every day, right? Like clockwork, literally. Oh. You know, utilize it. Now there's a learning curve. Like anything, mm -hmm. but also too, I think uh, we're, when we're when we're talking recreational, I think a lot of people uh, had the learning curve from going from say like a thousand feet to thirty thousand feet. Oh yeah, right. There's a lot of these factors that go in it, but most of all, and I can't stress this enough, your biggest enemy mm -hmm. isn't the guy growing down the street from you. Mm -hmm. Your biggest enemy is the state, yeah. right? The politicians that are making these crazy bogus rules off of a whim. Look at uh, Aspergillus in Oregon, you know, for example. That, I mean, that got My reversed. opinion on that was, yeah. I don't think they wanted to open that Pandora's box because yeah. you start opening that Pandora's box, mm -hmm. you you put it into law. You can push yeah. that over to food. Right now, cannabis is safer than our food supply, mm -hmm. right? When it Absolutely. comes to what you can put on food compared to what you can put on cannabis, right? Yeah. But they also too, as a as a group, pushed back on it, yeah, right. But also too, the you know the powers that be were like, actually, we can't really open this Pandora's box. They're going to start digging around, kicking the box around. Next thing you know. We're gonna get we're gonna get some results Bigger that we problems. didn't want. You know Absolutely. what I'm saying, right? And and a lot of people don't recognize, and rightfully so. They got their whole, you know, they got their regular life, all that stuff. But but if you really took a second and realized how we're, you know, these rules and everything is meaning is it's not for the greater good of what's going on. But mm -hmm. that's where I was saying before is is going off a of Washington standard. So if you're right. a tier one, that means you're a two thousand square foot grow, and then if you're a tier two, that's a ten thousand square foot cap grow. Mm -hmm. If you're a one or a two. I would say, take a minute and find out your other tier ones and your other tier twos. Yeah, go meet them, go talk to them. Mm -hmm. Right, you don't have to work with them; just do know of them. Right? right, but support each other on mm -hmm. social media with you know however it works. Right, because you have the much larger guys that can outproduce you. Lack of better terminology, but it can flood the market. Yeah, but as a group, 
you got to getting that information into people's hands and they're seeing it on their screens, right? They're going to go, Oh, you know what? I'm going to go check this, this, this label out. Right? right. Cause we don't have that distinction yet outside of a couple of situations where, where you have a branding. Right. And then the, the larger brands are normally already a small operator, you know, fulfilling those much larger brands that you see across the country or right. whatnot. These but MSOs and 100%. Washington's beautiful though. Washington I love Washington. I work with House of Cultivar up in Washington mm -hmm. and also Can Organics. I work with them on the, you know, we've done projects together and stuff like that. Uh, but I love Washington. It's it's smaller and I feel like it has an educated market up there. Like the, I think the, the customers are a little more educated than in other states. Uh, they trust their brands. Look, Pacific Northwest is always found and carved out their own lane. Yeah. Right. Make no mistake about it. Like, um, like we are literally in, in the rain shadow, right, of California. Yep. You know, so, but, uh, but what that said is, is that's just, that just goes to show the tenacity of, uh, people that are from the Pacific Northwest, right? Yep. Uh, we're going to find a way, right? We'll, we'll bump the car, we'll crash the car along the way, but we're going to find a way and we're going to be the best at it. Now you have, uh, you know, other places that are, that are going to catch up. But when you look at the model that's up there, I don't necessarily agree with how they set up the model because, I agree. because yeah. you create the retail as the gatekeeper, mm -hmm. right? Um, but back, back to what I was saying, all you tier one and all you tier twos, you guys come together and you start creating a ruckus and you, and stop asking, start demanding co-op, start demanding, you know, uh, farmer market style situations, start demanding where you can actually bring in the customer or bring in the person and educate them on what you're doing. Right. right. And the way that that works is you guys all coming together because you, you know, right now they think they're all competition with each other. Yeah. You know, and I like, no, no, your ship has some holes in it. You need to plug them up. And the way you're going to do that is teamwork, right? Mm -hmm. Now, whether they do that or not. But like, as an example, you got Ghost out there, which is from uh, Kush Family Originals, right? Yeah. That guy is a beast when it comes to the 502 market, right? Ghost OG, classic. Yeah. But, that he's out a, there. yeah. But, yeah. but with the way he operates and where he runs out there, he's a beast. He's, mm -hmm. he's, he's like quality in, quality out. But it pulls no stops, yeah. right? Well, we'll you want to come at him with something? He's coming right back at you. Like as an example, one of the funniest things, he had one of the largest, larger companies, uh, Fat Panda, mm -hmm. put up a post one time. Who's better, Fat Panda or, or Kush Family? And it was bad. It was on. It was on their on their post, That's but they hilarious. just got ratioed. Yeah, right. So, so what does Ghost do? Dresses somebody up in a panda outfit comes out of his house on a video. He's like, you spying on me, Panda? Right? And, and you can see the Panda kind of kind of peeking his head around the corner. But that kind of stuff, comedy, is hilarious. Now, yeah. I think the camaraderie between the two companies was awesome. Yeah. Because it made people laugh. Everybody mm -hmm. had a great time. You know, and they all got it. They all got exposure of it. Yeah. Uh, of it, you know. But that's where, but also, too, he backs it up. He's like when the rosin that he's putting on the market, right? You know, he's very critical about it. So, so now there's a bunch of other other people that have that exact same story that are putting out a great, you know, great product, but they're getting overshadowed because they don't have the reach or or whatnot, you know. Sure. And uh, and so, but yeah, with with Washington in particular, is you have these groups that say they're fighting for you, mm -hmm. but I call them like they're they're controlled opposition. Yeah. Right. You know, and mm -hmm. um, it's very telling. Right. When they're always asking you for money, but they're not doing anything, but they're telling you, oh, we're doing this or we're doing that. And, you know, speaking about on that is like with those with those groups. Right. Mm -hmm. You got to really look into them and see yeah. what they are doing for people. So that way you're not wasting your time or wasting your money. And also, too, I, I always tell people it costs 25 bucks, 50 bucks run yeah. for city council. Right. Yeah. Run for something. Even if you don't think you're going to win, you might surprise yourself. But what it does is if you take votes from somebody, they got to come and they got to give you concessions. They mm -hmm. got to, you know, that way you can say, hey, if, if you're like, I would love to see one point in this country because we come in numbers. If we all stood together, right. Mm -hmm. And was like, you know what, we're going to stop this shit right now. And we're going to make them come give us concessions because we have this people that don't identify they might be a republican might be a democrat whatever the hell it is right yeah. you got this background but we're going to protect this plant and make sure you can't steal it from us mm -hmm. and and then that that translates and starts flowing down to to the local levels right that gives people the the inspiration to also stand up You're like well if they're saying something i'm gonna say something mm -hmm. right so it, it, it's it's weird that's how this country works right you push sure. push 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 and then all of a sudden we push back 
And then the government would be like, whoa, 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 slow down, slow down, you know, right? On a local level and even on a national level. Right. But yeah, that's where it comes to is, is I always urge people, work together, get outside of your comfort zone, get outside of your box and, yeah. and stop, stop recognizing people that aren't your competition. And that's actually, uh, you know, your ally in this. And in that way, the people that are those groups that I just talked about have to do the right thing. Right. Right. Because all of a sudden the money will dry up or mm -hmm. that group will form another group that will actually go fight for them. Right. Well, so let's talk about uh, something that's been a regular conversation with the last couple of episodes, which is uh, descheduling or reschedule. More so reschedule. Well, What's your opinion on the, the reschedule and deschedule? So the so the dropping into schedule three, mm -hmm. right, is a clear evidence that they are going to try to control this plant, right? right? And what I mean by that is a schedule one, they get all this covered, they get to hide, you know, like oh, it's 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 schedule one, it's still illegal, but with the schedule three, is it bounces and keeps the ball in pharmaceutical court, right? right? Okay, um, pharmaceutical industry. And and uh, and tobacco and mm -hmm. alcohol are the three largest lobbies, and everywhere things are going to go legal, right? They're the three largest lobbies that are on the no vote, right? I should tell you, right? Because that means that it's going to hurt them in the pocket. Okay, we all know cannabis helps a lot of people in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. right? That information has been suppressed, right? So they're going to push and try. So then what do they do? Biden came out, Biden and Democrats, right? This is where they really screwed up. They campaign on decriminalization. Right. Right. Then we get this bogus pardon. Right. But, uh, you know, but the real reason why that pardon came about wasn't to do the greater good for the country because it got nobody out of jail. What it was is they were getting ready. And I even posted about it the day that that pardon dropped. They're getting ready to do a deal with Russia to release a WNBA player in exchange for the most notorious arms dealer in human history. Right. Right. That's not a really good trade, if you ask me, you know, right? But 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 aside from that, they can say now, because the Griner was was in jail for possession, mm -hmm. right? Which was a is was bogus and I think it was like nine years or something like that. But you can't have the same charge, same rules on your in your country, right? That you're advocating to get, you know, the, the too harsh of a penalty, et cetera. Right. Right. But so that comes out and they they he could have stroke of a pen. Yeah. Decriminalization. We mm -hmm. could have that right now. Right. Yeah. You know, but the, but the, but that would mess up the total plan. And that's, and that's the total control of this plant. Because mm -hmm. if the true, every, there's a few people that are in the know, but if the true properties and importance of this plant information actually came out, it'd be a game changer. In fact, there was a tiny little snippet back in 2014, uh, Medicare or Medicaid, one of those two, mm -hmm. right. In Washington alone, saved $33 million, yeah. right? And that was because people foregoed their going to get their prescription mm -hmm. and was hitting the dispensaries. And I think that rung a bell to a lot of a lot of these special interests, right? Like, oh, well, people are getting out of taking our pills. We need to- we That's need a to, problem. That's a problem, yep. right? Because right around that time, um, you had, uh, you know, you had the CBD patent, right? Mm -hmm. by, that was issued by the patent office for the you know, human and health services, right? right? Now, there's a long way about going about Schedule 3, but the way I see Schedule 3 and the reason why it's going to Schedule 3 is to give the what they consider the peasants the flower, right? and then they lock down the extraction because yeah. that's where the real medicinal aspect is. This is, is in the extractions, mm -hmm. right? And that's, uh, but then they can't come out and decriminalize because we live in a country that, you know, incarceration is a business. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to let a bunch of people out of, out of jail, you know? Um, there's a lot of people in jail that shouldn't be in jail. But For sure. Also, too, as a country, we we have to take accountability on ourselves for not standing up. The reason why the politicians don't do half the stuff we don't you know want them to do mm -hmm. is because we don't push back on them, right? right? If you don't push back and they don't not force to do it, they're just not going to do it, right? But they, what they'll do. But one thing that I saw when when the news came out that they were going to move it to Schedule Three is I saw people go, "Well, it's better than Schedule One." And it's like, no, it's not, right? No. And then, and they're like, it's virtually not going to change anything. And, you know, it's pretty much legal now. And it's like, you got to look at the fine print, right? Yeah. But what I just saw is, is like, I come from a time where it's fight or flight, right? And and I got the scars on my face because I always chose to fight, 
And I think that's where we're losing in this country is we're losing the desire to fight, but mm -hmm. or we just haven't clicked on what to fight for yet, right? And yeah. that's where I think a lot of this is is boiling out to is, is I think people want to fight, but they're been so suppressed and beat down that the incremental stuff like a Biden pardon or, you know, the the moving to schedule three is, oh, that's progress. In reality, yeah. it's virtually nothing. Well, we as a society, especially in the United States, have become so fragile and soft over the last 50 years, especially. And the other thing is, is like we're looking at symptoms rather than the causes of symptoms. A lot of people see this and that's a symptom of a much bigger problem. And we really need to start recognizing the, the problems rather than the symptoms. It's cause and effect. 100%. Right? So, so you're going to you're going to go, oh, okay, here's the effect. I'm going to concentrate on this. But I'm going to completely ignore the cause. This is like uh, it's just like you learn this in growing, right? So, so you'd be like, oh, I got an issue with my plant. Maybe I got some bugs. I'm going to spray it. Come back in the next day or two, it's struggling. And then mm -hmm. you go, oh man, it got worse. But it's just it's just what you sprayed on it. It's got yeah. to recover from it, right? Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, you're going down this rabbit hole, right? And then you're digging in the soil, all that stuff. But when in reality, if you would have just comprehensively taken a second and looked at it and go, here's my plan. This is what I'm going to do to fix it, yeah. right? You wouldn't go down the rabbit hole. So that's where I think a lot of people run into this is, is like, like they, they're, they're so focused on the effect that they forget about the root cause. And this comes back to in a lot of situations, like even with, with hemp, right? Mm -hmm. You know, hemp hands down could almost create, in my opinion, world peace. And, and the way, the reason why I say that is because it would literally get us off the dependence of foreign oil. Right. Right. Uh, we would, we would almost virtually replace plastic in a, you know, in just a number of years, mm -hmm. right? We wouldn't have this big old huge uh, patch in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that's choking out all our stuff, right? Microplastics. Just the ground cover of a cover crop of hemp mm -hmm. and the amount of, you know, uh, the oxygen that it would, it would give then and, and the impurities that it would suck out, but also too, the bioremediation of where that plant is. But you got to look on the flip side. There goes the petroleum industry, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to take a hit. Plastic, right? They're saying that they want to produce three or four more times the amount of plastic than we already produce today. That's yeah. what they're projecting, mm -hmm. right? That is crazy to me. We're like, where in the hell are you going to put all this plastic, yeah. right? You know, oh yeah, it's going to go in that big old ocean there in the Pacific Ocean and swirl in a circle. But also too, when you start digging into it, right? We mm -hmm. had this uh, back in 2018, 2017, 2018, we had this big old huge hemp that was coming on, right? And FDA came in and squashed it. Right? Why did the FDA come in and squash it? Right? Because people are now recognizing CBD really helps, and this is a quick, efficient way to get CBD. Yeah. Right. People are beginning to put in water. They were going to put in foods. They were beginning to put in edibles. Now that becomes a problem. The pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. Right. So the FDA is there to protect the pharmaceutical industry. It's supposed to be the other way around. They're supposed to protect us from. It's the, supposed to be right. Yeah. But, but when you really break it down, and and you, anybody can fact check this, seventy percent of FDA funding comes from the very people they're supposed to regulate. Right. They're not going to go kick their gift horse in the mouth. So if that, if that, those industries say, hey, go curb this, right? Mm -hmm. They go, we can curb this and we'll hide behind the DEA. Yeah. Right. Because the DEA is anti everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way that they're set up. No fault of their own. That's what they're, they're there for the enforcement. So, so you have the FDA that is a captured agency, mm -hmm. right? You have all, a lot of these agencies are captured agencies. So as you start seeing, the progress of the studies, right? The NIH, mm -hmm. right? Say you're a scientist at NIH and you're, you develop something, you actually, you actually get part of the patent, you know? So if you develop something and, and when the NIH develops a patent, it goes from there straight to a pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. But even though it's all taxpayer studied, funded, the whole nine, yeah. then the pharma takes it and they go, well, we're going to charge you 10 times, 30 times, 40 times, 50 times the amount, right? Yeah. And so when they do that, that's why we have a seizure medication that costs $34,500 a year, right? Mm -hmm. That is just pure CBD oil in a country where your median income is $55,000. They just tax a bunch of people that feel more comfortable in the pharmaceutical realm. Mm -hmm. you, can you can virtually make this for pennies on the dollar, right? right. Uh, but if... Somebody puts that information out there, immediately discounted, et cetera, all that, you know, but, uh, but what you see is, is that's a small little glimpse of what this, what this future looks like. You have 
Pfizer that bought Arena Pharmaceutics, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the main reasons why they bought Arena Pharmaceutics because they their heart medication, right? You know, uh, but they were building, a, they were they created a medication. Uh, I think it's called Olin Lab or or something similar to that, right? Mm -hmm. It's a CBG uh, derived uh, medication, and it treats Crohn's disease. Yeah. Okay. Now, people that suffer from Crohn's disease or suffer from seizures, right? Any little bit of relief goes a long way with those folks, right? Yeah. So now that medication, when it hits the market, it's going to be a hundred thousand dollar a year market, even though you could take some plants, grow them in your yard and virtually make it yourself. Right. Yeah. That's the information they want to suppress. The that's why they want to, yeah. that's why they want to knock the home grower out. That's right. why they want to, they want to kneecap a lot of this, sure. this stuff. And that's why I think hemp and cannabis relationship, it has the ability to really change how we do stuff because Cannabis and hemp will bring our jobs back. Mm -hmm. It'll bring manufacturing back. It'll make U.S. a back again, true power, right? We've mm -hmm. lost a lot of power around the country. This country, they came over and the ropes on the boat were made of hemp, Absolutely. right? You know, it was even a law where you had to grow hemp, right? right. You know, so, so it's not like we're reinventing the wheel here. We just mm -hmm. need to take control of the wheel again. And yeah. the way I see that happening is, is, the people coming together, the people talking, people having these conversations, getting this information out. Yeah. And if you're not mad, you're not paying attention. Right. You know, I I go heavy in this because I'm passionate about this. I have the love for this plant. I have the love for the people that support in-house, support me, support the people that are doing the good work out there. You know, like there's a guy out in uh, Maine, right? Mm -hmm. His name's Shirley. And uh, he went from just going and attending these uh, committee meetings, right? Mm -hmm. And then being vocal. Wow. Then he really started gaining traction. Then he goes and starts his own lobbying firm, right? Now those same politicians have a fear of this man. And I've watched this just happen in just in the past two years. And and he's, he's I wouldn't say he's crazy, but he's very passionate about what he does. And that's what, I, when I see it, I'm a big fan of him. Cause I'm like, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to speak truth to power, right? And if they're ignoring you, you yell louder, right? Mm -hmm. You know? And if you got to, you know, if you got to push it from there, you keep pushing until they, until they listen to you, until they hear you, you right. know? And, and I think we're getting to that point, all that, but in, in my opinion though, I think cannabis and hemp in itself could really have such an impact on this country. And it would be the newest you know, industrial revolution that would make it far better, far better world, you know? Yeah. You know, that's, and that's just the, you know, speaking honest, it's like you and I sitting here. Totally. So what's your opinion on the direction the cannabis industry has kind of gone with everything being gelato, purple candy gas, and you know, where do you see it going in the future? This comes back to it comes back to home growers. Yeah. Right. If you're a commercial farm, you have a license, I would go back and support the home growers. Home growers are going to protect and keep the genetic diversity. They're going to be the key to the continued success of having the diversity. Cause what you're going to have is you're going to have a lot of the bigger companies and MSOs yeah. that are going to give you equivalent to what would be a Budweiser, mm -hmm. right? The people that really want to, that are, what do you call legacy or people that really love the plan and want to be in it. They're going to be the micro brewers of the world. We already have this model where we could base it off of, and that's the craft brew model. Yeah. People working together. Back during the nineties, you had these shops that would pop up and you'd have five, six, seven, eight brewers in there brewing different stuff. As an example, the reason why we have IPA right now is mm -hmm. because it came from that movement, right? Absolutely. So, so my lawyer, right? He owns, a, he owns a couple stores there in Washington and, and he used to think the home grower was competition to him. And he, and I did a live one time and I, and he comes from part of the hops industry and, and the sure. beer industry. And I explained that to people on a live one time and he called me up after he goes, man, you know, he totally changed my mind on that. You know, right? But that's what I'm saying is, is is the roadmaps, all the information is there. Yeah. Right. So when I when I look at it as I go, protect the home grower because that is gonna be your line last line last line of defense when they come for you. So there's like that, there's that really famous poem, right? Mm -hmm. They came for me, or they came for such and such, I didn't say nothing. They came for such and such, I didn't say nothing. When they came for me, there was nobody to speak for me, right? You know, mm -hmm. there's more to it. But it but it's the same way, yeah. right? Money will money corrupts everything in this country. So mm -hmm. if you're in the way, they're gonna push you out the way unless they have some sort of resistance. But right. yeah, well, when you when you get it, uh, you know, back to what we were saying earlier, is go see what everybody else is doing, right? Yeah. And start phasing in other stuff and find your lane. Once you find your lane, right, then you're you're on you're on cruise control. And yeah. nothing against 
you know, people, if they feel that's what they want to do or anything like that, you right. know, uh, if, the, you know, it's a lot of this cookie that or whatever, then that, then carve out your own lane. Yeah. Just be the best at it. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and, right. and present it and give it to the world. But also too, the world is going to tell you whether you're any good or not. Yeah. Right. You're going to get re real feedback. Yeah. Well, you feedback is out critical. There. Like Absolutely. as an example, the, where like a lot of people miss is the, like, we mentioned earlier, social media is such an important part yeah. of, of what we do. Mm -hmm. And you see these companies where they're like, oh yeah, I have a Facebook page or I got a, I got an Instagram, but I don't really, I don't really, you know, do much with it. And it's yeah. like, you can't go and have a billboard. You mm -hmm. can't advertise anywhere. Right. You can't advertise there. You can't interact with people, right? Absolutely. You know, you can, you know, it goes a long way. Like as an example, we get a lot of messages, mm -hmm. right? I try to get through as many as possible. Right. But one of the cool things is once you hit up, be like, oh, damn, I didn't even think I was going to get a response. Right. Yeah. You know, and you're just passing information or, or whatever the hell it is. These companies need to more focus on the social media aspect of it. But also, too, my my advice is you have a live button, you have a video button. It's really easy to now do, you know, somewhat of a production. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not like you have to have a computer. You don't have to have all of this stuff. Right. Yeah. Take people on tours of your grow. Right. Or yeah. explain a situation or explain what you're doing. Because that way, when they see your brand uh, on the shelf, they go, oh, man, I saw that guy. Or I saw those people. They can I relate. Saw, there's, mm -hmm. there's, 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 there's all of a sudden a connection there. Yeah. Right. You know, the, you know people are going to grow what they're going to grow. Whatever you grow, just be the best at it and yeah. put it out to the world. And if it comes back negative, you're going to have to switch it up. Yeah. Give feedback, switch it up, figure out what, uh, what works for you, what you like and uh, what other people like as well. I mean, hey, think, feedback is scary to get yeah. because you're so such a prideful person. But I would say be open and receptive to it. Filter out the trolls. Filter mm -hmm. out the BS, right? right? And find the people that are really critiquing you in a way that are gonna that are gonna make you a better person. Right. That's that's what the, you want to focus on. But if somebody says, "Oh, your shit's mids or your trash or whatever," forget you, about that. You got to ignore those people because there's always going to be the naysayers. There's going to be the people that are saying you can't be successful, and you just got to push through. Figure out what works for you. I think uh, I can't wait for people to get some of these land race varieties back into the mix and some of these unique flavors. I think diversity is the key. I, I love working with diverse stuff, you know, and I, I also, but I also recognize what the market demands right now and the, what the market likes. But, you know, even some of these old flavors that I grew up with that we haven't had for a long time, I can't wait to see some of those hit the market again. Romulan yeah. is another one. It's like, dude, Romulan, my story with Romulan was. And there was this one guy, me and my roommate and would meet and uh and he and he had the he had the Romulan. That ounce, right, would mm -hmm. leave a room. And we're talking 30 minutes, 45 minutes later, you would think it was still in there. Oh yeah. We just don't have that really anymore. No, right? and why do you think that is? Uh, I think it's just um We've been in this mad dash to get uh, the highest THC content, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's a major factor, which is obviously going to take away from the other cannabinoids, going to take away from terpene profiles, right? Yeah. Uh, but when you mentioned land race, right? I'm excited that once the science starts coming out, right? Yeah. Some of these old people, some of these, you know, people that have been in it for a long time, they still have these old seeds they're sitting on, they're storing, yeah. right? But I think everything goes in cycles, right? And we'll start bringing it back. And then uh, that's one thing where I think hemp, right? Hemp yeah. is going to be pretty critical because you, if you have a high CBG plant, right? Which is a mother sure. of THC and, and CBD, mm -hmm. right? And you start uh, start crossing to that and, and back crossing to that, it may change and it, you'll start getting more of a more of a cannabinoid profile. Well, Mojave Richmond told me something the other day, a good friend of mine, amazing guy, that the, the race is over when the seed leaves the land. But the diversity is there. And mm -hmm. so that's what I love is all this diversity that we can throw in and finding new things. I mean, that's part of the reason I love breeding and I, I love the selection process. I love finding new things. I'm always about discovering new things and new possibilities. And that's respect, you know, and one thing is, is why I think the home growers are extremely important mm -hmm. because a commercial farm yes. isn't going to grow a low yielding plant. No. Okay. So a lot of a lot of magic and a lot of great things are found in the low yielding the ugly ugliest looking plants. plants. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, like what I'm starting to see, and, and we'll see if it how uh, if it becomes something. But uh, but plants that are really extremely uh, have the foxtailing trait, mm -hmm. you know, uh, not even stress induced trait, but just this foxtail. Yeah. Uh, now these now these washers are like that's what I want. 
right? Because it's more surface, you know, totally. right? Um, but you go back a couple of years, everybody was like, oh, look at that trash. It's fox tailing, you know. Keep dude, it away. Dude, yeah. Whatever. But it, it's it, but it's like ever changing, ever, ever uh evolving, you know. But like there's some people right now that have strains that we thought we've lost forever. They're just sitting on it. It's like one, there's a few strains to me that I'll always hold dear, mm -hmm. right? Um, I have one of the original or the award winning true OG, mm -hmm. right? That plant will never, never leave us, you know? Yeah. And what I mean by that is, is it'll go out and out, but I'll never lose that plant, right? Yeah. Um, that's just because uh, Derek from Elemental Seeds, you know, rest in peace. There's, there's a lot of history there and, you know, uh, from the Northwest. And then right. I got this, there's this other Gorilla Glue, right? That I, that I pulled from uh, another friend of ours that had passed away, right? And it's just a phenomenal, but so, as much heat as a lot of these, some of these strains get, right? Yeah. Um, they'll never go away. They'll always mm -hmm. stay. They'll always stay in, in in rotation or stay in you know in our house. But uh, but there's other people that have strains that are that are way older than that. They're still keeping around and just remothering and and all of that. So yeah. you'll see. You know, it, we'll see if we can keep up on the diversity. But I think you're gonna. I think you're gonna see people. Uh, when there's a lot more information come back, they're gonna start circling back around and being like, let's get this THC back to back into the low twenties. Let's bring the CBD back up, you know, CBD and so back. on. Yeah. Flavor. Yeah. We, there's going to be flavors that we'll probably come across that we didn't even think was, was possible, especially with that, with that many uh, terpenes and that information coming, everything yeah. is, is information. And mm -hmm. one thing about that plant is it's resilient. Just when you think you have it dialed in, it's like, nah, no, no, <laughs> right? right. I'm throwing you a curveball. Well, I think some of the pro problems we're having with like hoplite and viride could be due to, you know, breeding depression from all the gelato. So we need to get stuff back in there that's diverse to get some more vigor into the plants, to get them healthier. But uh, it, it's really interesting. We weren't even talking about viruses. Well, I know you're, I don't mean to cut you up. I yeah. know you talk a lot about that on your, mm -hmm. and I would, I'd love to get your opinion on this. Yep. It's not new. Right. Okay. There's a whole industry, mm -hmm. hop industry, right? Yep. Done ton of research on this right right why do we not know this inside and out right you know okay mm -hmm. if the hop can live with it right yeah. and the cannabis plant is a cousin of it yeah right well what's the what's the genetic marker that's allowing that to happen right what's well, the what's the process of, of this there's there's so many of these variables and and one thing that i see is is like it's a real thing okay yeah but it's not the end all end all because mm -mm. we've if you've grown for any certain amount of time i remember when basically aphids was like, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. right? Spider now mites. you're just killing that with Dawn soap, right? right. Okay. If you've ever deal, like, I'll tell you these, these, the broad mite mm -hmm. and the russet mite, those are spawns of the devil from hell, right? And I remember it used to be, that used to be a death sentence, Absolutely. right? And you're but like, oh, you know, the you solutions learn. were so easy though. That's the thing is like, yeah, especially russet mites. It's like, I thought, I thought life was over when we first got russet mites. Yes. But uh, what it took yeah. was a home grower going, hey, this is what I did. Yeah. Right? This is how I, this is how I eradicate it. We got right? some sulfur. Microthial hey, dispersed. Look, you can have yeah. you can have 10,000 people work on something, right? Mm -hmm. You know? Or you can be an ass and try to curb out an additional 100,000 or 200,000 people that are going to work on something. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right? And that's why, you know, I would always harp on how important the home grower is because I think... I think that vi that viroid will be solved by some guy growing in his growing in his tent right now that's got it and it's going to try to find a solution. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think there's there's a bunch of things that play in my opinion. Uh it's not just one virus. We have hoplaten that we talk about, but there's so many other pathogens that we're not talking about mm -hmm. that are contributing to the problem. But also hoplaten, there's so many different forms of hoplaten. It's not just one thing. It's not one there there's definitely a variance of hoplaten, just like yeah. there is of COVID and everything else. And some of them are worse than others. And I believe they have identified plants that are resistant to it. Uh, something with the yeah. anthocyanins. Yes. But yeah, it's, it's real interesting. Uh, Kevin McKernan from medicinal genomics, they've identified some stuff and, and other people as well. And I think you're right that we will be able to figure out what works with hoplaten, what doesn't, we'll be able to identify you know, how to breed that, you know, stuff that's resistant to it. But also we need to be able to test genetic material to find out if it has problems because yeah. then we just don't need but to. But what I mean stuff. by that is, is people way smarter than us, right? Yeah. In a way that are not just growers, but mm -hmm. also have the background, 
right? And we'll figure out a solution. Right. I just want to be very clear on that. It's just like yeah. you're not throwing you're not throwing things at a wall to see what sticks. But when you look at the grow community himself, there is some of the most intelligent people. And that's why that's why I always find it really weird when they when people will be like, oh, this stigma of the stoners and this and that, because some of the some of the best growers, some of the brightest people unfortunately get to interact with yeah. on a regular basis through through social media. And that's where ultimately, like I said, is is that's where the problems get solved. And you know, on the commercial side of stuff, mm -hmm. if I was a commercial grower, I would tap into the home grower, right? I would yeah. find the people that love hunting and go, you know what? I'm going to just keep you flush with packs, keep hunting it, find the best one, send it to me. And this is, this is now your, your job. Yeah. You don't even need to come to my facility, all that stuff, because, you know, there's so much talent out there and so many people that all they like to do, all they would like, love to do is hunt, you yeah. know? And, you know, you, you tap into that because you know how dangerous it is to hunt in a commercial facility because you got a you got a ton ton of variables there. You got a ton mm -hmm. of a ton of issues, you know. But yeah, it sucks that uh, we're in the thick of it. But it's like anything that we've encountered before. Right. It's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when mm -hmm. we find the solution. Now, the, some of the solutions are going to come in the via of the way of snake oil, right? Yeah. And there's going to come other solutions that are going to come in in a true viable solution, you mm -hmm. know. And also too. If the first time it doesn't work, try something else, but keep trying. Never stop trying, you know, and, you know, yeah. you'll, you'll eventually get there. But it's a, it's just tragic because it's a, it's a big thing. It will continue to be a big thing and it's devastating a lot of people in the process. Yeah. And I think things like sour diesel that we thought just got weak. We didn't even really understand what was happening. It was one of the early vectors of hoplite and viroid and. You know, I remember sour diesel as being this amazing thing and it had been years. I just, I showed you some sour diesel that I got earlier, but it had been years since I actually saw a real cut of sour diesel. But that's mostly because everyone switched over from growing sour diesel to Gorilla Glue, especially mm -hmm. in California and in Sonoma, Mendocino and Humboldt because the sour had problems. And also it was a longer flowering. The Gorilla Glue in some ways was superior as far as harvest. Although the terps, I mean, now, now yeah, name your price if you got good sour diesel. Well, back to back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, if you got a ten weeker or more, people commercial farms aren't going to grow it. No, time, real estate is expensive in the commercial market. Okay? Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to that diversity, but also going through those steps and trying to figure out how you're going to fix that and correct that, it's HLVD today. It's going to be something tomorrow. Right. Right. And uh, there's always going to be something on the horizon. Yeah. In my opinion, I wish it would. At this point, it would go to a university study. Yeah. Right. An unbiased universal the university study. And that way you get the full picture of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And unbiased. Because like uh, we have a great program up where up in the Northwest at, at UW. Yeah. Right. In fact, the uh, UW hash plant is how we created the platinum. Right. Wow. Uh, so the UW has had, a, has had a cannabis program for 25 years, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, something like that that's equipped to that. University of uh, Mississippi, um, which has actually been... Uh, They've been studying cannabis for 55 years. They get a ton of money from, from right. the government. So that's all I mean. If, when they say they're not studying it, they're lying to you. Right. Right. That was one of the arguments about a schedule three. No, we get to study it. And like, no, they're just choosing not to or not mm -hmm. necessarily uh, full on, full fledged. But okay. out of that, just yeah. like hops, you'd get a solution. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, and so until we get there, it's just you have a private sector, right? That's working on it. Private sector is for profit. Yeah. Right. And ultimately ended up in a gatekeeper situation. Right. You know, like we talked about pharma earlier. It's the same thing. Like, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, there I think there's plenty of cures. Right. Yeah. But I think what they do to it, they do this. Shelve it. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause it, you know, ain't no money in cures. Yeah. Right. You know, keep them, keep them coming, keep them churning. Yeah. And uh, and I just hope that cannabis doesn't go by that wayside where it's like, oh, we'll sell you the solution, but we're gonna sell you the treatment. Yeah. Right, you know, not the actual solution of it, mm -hmm. you know, but that's commercial like commercialization of everything in yeah. this country and, and and how it shakes out. And you know, the cool part is, is you're not going to stop learning, mm -hmm. right? You're you're going to see it. The the reason why I don't talk about it in depth is because, just like everybody else, I'm learning more about it. Yeah, I'm learning from people that are way smarter than me and seeing what they're having to say about it, and then continuing doing doing my research on the on the subject. Right. I like that you bring it up quite a bit, you know, yeah. and talk to every, just about every guest about it to get their get their opinion, you know. You get a yeah. little snippet of of good information from a lot of folks that you've talked to in the past. 
Yeah, and there's so much information out there and so many opinions on it. And, you know, and that goes with everything. Yeah. Well, opinion, we could look, if you don't talk to people, yeah. right, you ain't going to learn nothing. You know? Yeah, I mean, I've learned so much from doing this show uh, from, from the guests. And we have so many people that are smart uh, in their own right. In, in what, and they specialize in certain things like Reggie from Steep Hill. We, you know, mm-hmm. Originally from Steep Hill, he's at Front Range Biosciences now. But, you know, that was a great podcast. I learned a lot of stuff. Guy is highly intelligent. Dude. Extremely good at what he does. Yeah. Also, too, what I really liked about that particular one was when he conveyed the information, he conveyed it in a way where – a vast majority of the people understood. Yeah. Right. Didn't get too technical with it. Right. We, you can sit here and you can get real technical with a lot of stuff. Yeah. Right. But it gets lost in translation. A lot right? of PhDs you know? can't break it down. So everybody understands. That's, that's why that's, I think what you should do is create a third chair. Yeah. So that way when the PhD says something, you yeah. got the person that will break it down for the people at home. Totally. Right? <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, I mean, I'm just messing with you. Like, like speaking about PhDs, doctors, right? Like, yeah. uh, like right now, there's a there's a there's a lady out of Oregon that I'm a huge fan of, and it's, mm-hmm. her name's uh, Maeb Shields. Yes. Okay. She gets on there. And she got, she got a story, right? Mm-hmm. She's like, "This is how I took care of myself." So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna explain my journey and what I did, right? And if it helps you, cool. If not, at least you learned something along the way, right? right? So when I see her posters, or her stories, or post post, I I make a point to put it in our story, right? Because mm-hmm. I feel it's what people need to see. Yeah. There's another guy out there that's an actual medical doctor, Rashawn Hodge, right? Mm-hmm. So you had a family practice, but also too, he's the one that I was watching him on on a on a podcast and he's the one that really went in depth about the CB1 and CB2 receptors and how they fill up. Also gives you a little bit of background and how pharmacology works, right? Right. And he had a family practice, so he wasn't beholden to have to pump people up with antidepressants, this and that. Like, that's one thing that we didn't touch on, but even with hemp and cannabis, right? Yeah. I think that there's a solution there to be had when it comes to antidepressants. Yeah. They'd be, and then also to ADHD, right? Mm-hmm. Um, finding that combination, what it's going to take to get there is the key, is, is the key factor to it. Yeah. But I think that's, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a solution to that. I think there's potential solutions out there with psychedelics as well. They haven't been explored and, and they will be explored. But yeah. I think it's like, uh, it's going to have to be us to be vocal about it, to say, hey, th- we want to at least try this. Because when it comes to, a lot of people understand when it comes to antidepressants and ADH medication, it changes your brain chemical makeup. Mm-hmm. It literally over time changes it. I've gone to the doctor for a checkup. Yeah. And the doctor starts asking me, hey, how you feeling? Right. Well, I'm feeling all right. Uh, you know, the, sometimes it's stressful. He's like, how many stress days do you have? All this stuff. Right. Yeah. I'm like, man, I don't know. Like, I, you know, you got your good days, you got your bad days and all that stuff, right? And yeah. uh, somehow my medical records ended up putting on where I had uh, at some point a prescription for antidepressants. So I was like, so if I came into the hospital incapacitated, you guys would have pumped me through full of these, you know, right? Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, but it, it just goes to show how easy it is. Not to say that it's not effective, not to say that it doesn't help people. Yeah. But I think the, at the rate that it is prescribed to people, I think there's alternatives for people. That they don't necessarily have to have to go that route. And that's yeah. where I think the cannabis hemp and that aspect coming out will keep people off the dependency of drugs. And also, too, right? We have a heroin fentanyl crisis. Oh, yeah. Right? And, and it's shown great results in, on helping people with that. Because when you're coming off of that, the biggest fear for people, mm-hmm. right, is the pain. That, that you're going to go through. Well, and part of the problem with medicine, you know, Western medicine especially, is that we want to put it all in a nice little box, but our body chemistries are so unique and so different that what works for one person doesn't always work for the next. You know, and we're starting to understand, uh, you know, as far as genetics and, you know, inherit, inherited problems, but these body chemistries are so unique to the individual that we as individuals need to understand that we need to try different things potentially and try multiple different things to understand medicine for ourselves. You know, so we have to take steps for ourselves as individuals, which, you know, the government and not, not just the government, but doctors in general want to classify you as a certain way and you need this, this, and this, and they have an SOP based on this. And it's not always so cut and dry. And that's the beauty of using cannabis and, you know, psychedelics for all these things. But they're really hard for doctors to quantify. Understand your medical history and your family history, yeah. right? Is a is a great start and huge start because mm-hmm. I think when you see the 
basically CHS and a few other things are coming on, right? Yeah. I think if you have a onset in your family or yourself of psychosis, yeah, this is going to trigger it. Yeah. Not a matter of if it's a matter of when, right? So you have to always factor that in, right? right. Uh, the uh, but also other 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 uh, medical issues that you that you might have. So yes, mm -hmm. it's education, and I think that's you know where a lot of this stuff comes uh, sh up short is the lack of education. And people sometimes maybe they don't want to feel like they're out, like you know they're afraid to ask or yeah. afraid to talk about it. You know, uh, better the more people talk about it, the quicker and faster you're going to get a solution. You know, right. But you have to understand your body. You have to understand yourself. You have to understand, you know, uh, your your also your family history. Mm -hmm. You know, that way that way you can make adjustments. That's just anything in life when it comes to when it comes to the uh, medical aspects of it. Yeah, I mean, I have a very open doctor. He's open to hearing all my crazy ideas and tells me which ones are crazy. But we have a very open uh, relationship as far as conversations. I can I can have a good conversation about why I use this or why I use that. I have Crohn's and I have ulcerative colitis. They're both in remission right now. But uh, it, it's really interesting because if you don't have a doctor like that, you should find a doctor if you if you enjoy cannabis, especially that you can have that real conversation with your doctor about why you use it or, you know, or alternative medicine. You know, I'm a huge fan of alternative medicine. So it's, yeah. It, and it sucks when you, when you, when it gets the terminology of that, yeah. right. Because when it comes to nature, right. Mm -hmm. That's where all sol solutions are is in nature. Okay. Right. And where we run into a problem when it comes to medication is when you synthesize it. Yeah. Right. Synthetics do not do well in the human body. Well, right. there's synthetic food. I mean, foods too, processed foods. Synthetic processed foods, like like I was saying, is, is that's what I was saying earlier. Cannabis is safest, one of the safest, if not the safest product on the market when it yeah. comes to something that you're going to ingest, right? Mm -hmm. Because our food is sprayed with all Roundup, everything else. Well, with that said, though, is is like, yeah, the if you know if you had hemp that was say running, you know, grown wild, right? That mm -hmm. means the cows are going to eat it. That means yeah. that the, those cannabinoids are going to be in the meat that you yeah. eat, right? But when, uh, but as when you look at history, right? When we started doing processed foods, right? High fructose corn syrup is terrible for you, yeah. right? Uh, and you know it's more worse than than the alternative, right? When your solution is worse than you know your new thing is worse than what it was before, right? But uh, but that's how you're able to capture a lot of stuff. Plus, at the time when they went to high fructose corn syrup, we had a big huge sugar situation down south. You know, right. uh, there, there, there's a lot of politics that go into reasons why we have things the way that they are, you know. Sure. But, uh, but yeah, when it comes to, when it comes to that is, is nature in itself will heal itself. That's why even with the, um, like whether, which side of the fence people fall on global warming or, you know, choking our oceans with the plastic. Mm -hmm. I can tell you one thing. Mother Earth is going to correct it. Yeah. It's either with us or without us. Mm -hmm. It does not matter because that's not going to stop, right? You know, so that's where, you know, we have to kind of look at a lot of this stuff and and stop treating this planet in a sense like we have another place to go, yeah. you know, but uh, but you got to protect nature because we're going to lose stuff that is going to be critical for this generation's future generations and et cetera. And that's just a normal, you know, die off of, of certain things. But, yeah. you know, I think everything that's, that we have an issue right now, we could, we could find a solution in nature. But yeah. I think that the first actual, I guess, would be cannabis or cannabis death, you mm -hmm. know, contributed would be a synthetic product. Yeah. Kind of similar like how the what, the flocker or whatever, mm -hmm. the, 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 the uh, synthetic cannabinoids would make people go crazy, all that stuff, right? But the news is going to completely gloss over that fact yeah. and just attack the plant itself, right. even though the plant didn't do anything. Because mm -hmm. by itself, it's an amazing thing. You know, and I think... To a degree, with our breeding, we're screwing it up. That it's not in its natural hab inhabitants. That's where it thrives and does the best, as far as medicine. But uh, you know, that's just I opinion. disagree on that, and, yeah. and the reason why I disagree on that is because we're constantly learning and, and evolving, mm -hmm. right? Just take yourself as an example. From what I've saw today, what yeah. talking to you and your plans and what you're looking to do, yeah. right? To me, that that says you're on a great path. You're yeah. bringing and bringing it back the other way. You recognized now way it was going, so you go. You know what? I'm gonna steer the ship over to this way, right? You, you, yeah. You know, so so when you see that, you're not alone. There's a lot of people that also witness that and seen that, right? Yes, right. we we went down this crazy path, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that path is now we're starting to see, you know, the wall at the end of that path. So we got to kind of you know turn it out right. of that. And I think you, myself, a lot of these people 
around our seeing the writing on the wall and hearing what people are saying and going to, you know, going to correct the ship. But, but it comes to where we don't care in a sense, whether it's sanctioned or not, we're going to do it anyway, yeah. you know? Right. And I think that's what, what scares a lot of the powers that be is, is like, well, we can't get rid of it because they'll just take it back underground, you yeah. know, like as an example, when, um, when they were, when the time, I don't want to say the name or what about it, but you know, when they told everybody to go home and stay there, right. Until yeah. further notice, the States were so greedy that they were like, keep the dispensaries open. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because they was for your greater good. They didn't want that tax money to stop rolling. Right. You know, absolutely. So, especially in Washington. Right. Yep. You know, so there's, there's, they're not there for your, for your greater good, you know? So that's where you're kind of like, um, you know, when you start seeing all this, all this stuff and coming in and, and you're recognizing it, but I, I'm really, you know, a huge fan. Uh, and especially after what I saw today and the direction you're going, I'm, I'm super excited to, to see where you, where you go with that. You know, I don't want to go yeah. into depth with it cause I don't know if it's, if it's a secret or not, but no, no, I'm, it's, it's I'm not pretty a stoked about I, it. I try to be as transparent as possible for the most part. I mean, yeah, there's some formulas and stuff that we're working on and, and things that we're doing that, you know, we keep under wraps, but the, like, just like with my book, there's no secrets in my book. It's like, I tell everybody what I, I do and what I'm doing. And it, I try to put as much authentic information out there as possible so that the little guy can compete with the big guy. That's, that's part of what I think is valuable where I think us together, we're not competing against each other. We're, you know, competing against big pharma and other things like that. You, you know, you could, you could, uh, argue, but, uh, I think the biggest thing is authenticity too. Like, I yeah, think I don't think it's like when it comes to when it comes to competition, yeah. right? Like, we can do the exact same thing. We can still be friends. Yeah, right. You're gonna get one. I'm gonna get one. You know, we're gonna we're gonna do this exchange. Go back and forth. Yeah. So one thing is is like, especially in house in particular. Yeah, we don't. We'll never see us knock somebody else's work right. or what they're doing or anything like that. Now, you if you're a terrible person or whatever, right? sure. Okay, then that's a little bit different. Yeah, but when it comes to people's work. Mm -hmm. Right. You'll never see a knock come from come from that direction. That's just because we're a fan of the plant. We're a fan of the people. We're a fan of what what people do. Yeah. You know, and so the same sentiment along your lines. Right. Yeah. So when I see what you're doing, I don't like it as competition. I don't like it like if you're behind or if you're ahead. Right. Yeah. I'm like pretty stoked. I got this. Now I got this direct connection with this person. Yeah. I'm going to be in the loop with what he's doing. I get to share my information, so on and so on. And ultimately, those end results as they, you know, start to come out as yeah. a better situation, not just for us, but everybody else that's, that's around. Exactly. And we want to be Gore-Tex. We're not trying to be Nike or all these other things. I want to collaborate with people. I want to work with other people. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, when you break it down, we're just stewards of the plant and hopefully we're putting it in a good direction. Yeah. Well, the, I like some aspects and some I'm against, but the, the direction of the core people yeah. and the way that, uh, you know, the, the, the core, I guess a core group of people, mm -hmm. I really like that direction because it's a core of fighters. It's a core of people that, that come from a, you know, come from a history there, there's, there's that, there's that dynamic. And so that gives me great hope that, Hey, you know, when, when push comes to shove, you're going to get shoved. And, you know, and if the, if it comes to getting, you know, having to slap somebody in the mouth, you know, right. Whether yeah. it's the FDA or whoever it is. You're going to have the power of the people to back you to, to do that, you right. know? And so like, uh, you know, that's one thing is like, even when I was touched a bit on the FDA, right. Mm -hmm. All the people that head the FDA, when yeah. they leave the FDA 61st day, they're sitting on a board of a pharmaceutical company. Yeah. That is crazy. That should be illegal. There's, you mm -hmm. know, I don't mind. I've never talked down to somebody getting their money. Right. But at the right. same time, that's that that is crazy. You know, right. Yeah. You're just the same people you're supposed to regulate. And now you work for them. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, the, that that kind of that kind of thing. But so as far as us being stewards, I feel like there's a big responsibility for us to do good with it. But also we're working on the shoulders of a lot of the people that came before us. It's like a lot of the breeding work has been done over the last, you know, couple hundred years. I mean, we're refining it in a way that they didn't do. But a lot of the stuff, start, you know, especially in the last 40 years. Yeah. You know, I think it's pretty amazing how far the plan has come in the last 40 years. Well, think about it. Think about the folks up in Humboldt that jumped on a plane. Yeah. So, you know, we're on the same latitude as uh, Afgh Afghanistan. Yeah. Right. So let's go spend some time over there. Let's go learn about that. And they smuggled those, those seeds back in. Mm -hmm. 
just from that action, look how much change and innovation that's Completely birthed. changed the game. hundred percent, you know? And so that's where, you know, that's, you know, these, those little pockets, those little stories and those type of things is yes, you have to respect the people that came before you, but not only that, learn from them, yeah. you know, it's just like people are going to learn from the things that we do. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and all that. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a generational thing, you know, and that's really, if you can, like I said, if you can touch one person and, and they learn from you and they're like, Hey, you know, then, then you did your job. You did, you did what you're supposed to. You made right. your small little pocket that much better. Right. You know, made your, your, that impact on the, on the world. But absolutely. I think that, you know, especially a lot of people that should be vocal and should be out in the open mm -hmm. were so traumatized by the bogus war on drugs that they don't want to come out. They're still yeah. afraid. It's kind of like being in a bomb shelter for 50 years because they thought Cuba was sending the missiles over and then they come out and they've made movies about it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Right? And everything's changed and all that stuff. But it's too, like, those are great sources of, of information, but they've just been, you know, beat down, right? And and lied to and, and propaganda that they, they're afraid to, they, they think that they're going to get arrested for even just talking about what they did in the past. You know, right. there's a lot of people, I've met a lot of people like that. So I got one last question for you. If you were to look back at your younger self that had been in the industry for one or two years, what is the one piece of advice you would give your younger self? I would just remind the, just kind of the reminder of, of the dark days lead to the better sunny days, right? Uh, it's a lot of work, you know? I mean, it's, it's hard to say because when you, when you really break it down and when you think about it, it's like, what would you tell your younger self? And I've even had this conversation with a couple of people. It's like the way everything panned out and everything worked out, yeah. I don't even know if I'd even want to tamper with that by giving a little insight, right? Because every little thing, all those hard days, all those good days, all that stuff accumulated to make you, you know, the person you are, right? And and how and how it shaped out. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like when you go to even farther back when you're a kid and yeah, child, you know, terrible childhood, the whole nine, right? Yeah. Chose not to make it an excuse, right? That I'm gonna build off of it. It's gonna teach me. It's gonna teach me not to get into harsh drug habit, right? Because mm -hmm. I know I see seen in my childhood what it does, right? Yeah. You know, and so when you get those type of questions like what kind of advice, right? I'd rather go back and and kind of watch and see, you know, right? And and reminisce that way. But I don't know if I'd really want to give myself advice because I think it would change my trajectory and the things that I do. And, and it would, it would be a total different outcome. Those type of questions are, are hard for me because I really pride myself on overcoming the adversities, overcoming the stuff that, you know, overcoming the stuff that was supposed to take you out. You know, um, I really value friendships. I really value a ton of stuff. That's why I have some of the same friends from, uh, when I, you know, when I went to school, sorry to disappoint you on that question, but no, no, that was, that was a great answer. <laughs> it's funny. Cause we get this wide, amount of you know the diversity in the answers is all across the board and i love that answer so i think my younger self would yeah. literally tell me to fuck off yeah right. you know what i mean right excuse totally. the language but you know it'd be like beat yeah. it beat it old man what are you talking about right, right. i got this right yeah. that's the mentality you've always had like mm -hmm. yeah i got this right or or you know um like even with my partner we joke all the time because it's like for us to kind of inquire like, oh, extra help or something like that, right? It's just yeah. you're you're stubborn, like, oh, I'm just going to do it myself, right? We, you know, we're, we're on that same path, but it's like anything, right? Mm -hmm. You just, you're just going to do it, you're, you know, no matter how hard it is, right? You know? Yeah. yeah. So it, it makes it, makes it a pretty interesting, interesting dynamic. But yeah, I would, that's, uh, that's one of the things where you, when you, when you look at those type of questions or those hypothetical questions, you're like, I don't know if I'd want to change anything, you know? Yeah. Save more money, you might not end up in the same position. How about you? Never. What would you do? So no one's ever asked me that. But if I was to go back in, you know, I would say, don't worry about the small stuff. You know, one foot in front of the other and everything's going to be okay. I think yeah. that would be my big answer. And, you know, that's, that's one. My big takeaway is that it's all going to be okay. And there's going to be bad days and there's going to be great days. And you got to live in the moment. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey and enjoying every single moment you're alive because you never know when it's going to end. If anybody's interested in finding more about you, uh, where can they go? Uh, they can find us on Instagram. They can find us on Facebook. One of the big issues with that is, is uh, our accounts are usually in the thirties or 50,000 followers. That's how you know you have the, have the real one. Yeah. Right. We still kind of got that mentality where it's like, if you, if you're looking for us, you're going to find us. Right. Yeah. And I want to stress to this, in-house does absolutely no sales whatsoever over social media, yeah. right? Or email or anything or like that. Or telegram. 
Telegram, none of that. Right. Can't stress it enough, right? So yep. if you see our logo trying to sell you something, automatically know that it's fake, right. okay? We have, we pride ourselves on our seed banks, right? These are great folks, right? And yep. they'll make sure that you never get scammed. And if you ever have an issue, they will take care of you. That prevents a lot of, lot of trouble. Totally. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, look forward to communicating with you in the future and potentially collaborating. Yeah. Thanks for having me. For and, sure. And uh, dude, I'm a big fan. Awesome. Thank you again. Thanks.